Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Azubiki Chidaka, the founder of Old Ninja Football, and you're welcome to another episode of the Afcon Diaries. This today's Afcon Diaries will be different. It's not going to be like the usual way we have players come in to talk about their experiences. This time I want to see the Afcon from the perspective of a journalist, a seasoned journalist at that matter. Um, my guest today is none other than Mr. Olu Ashina Okeliji one of the um, seasoned journalists from years gone by who has covered so many African tournaments, many international tournaments for Nigeria, and has been writing about Nigeria players over the years. I remember the, the days of kickoff, kickoff magazines where my dad would bring those magazines home on the weekends and I would read so many interviews and the name Oluwashi Naokelej kept appearing, especially for Victor Obina's interviews back in the day. So. To know that he's my special guest this morning, uh, me this afternoon, and he's here to share his Afcon experience and also bits of his career. Um, I'll say I don't know if he's online at the moment, but I'll look for him, and then I'll send him a message. So I read a lot of kickoff magazines, and I'll see his work. Even in my research work over the last seven years, I always keep seeing the name Oluwashina Okeleji for many um, articles I do go and resource out for or want to like have a recap on and all of that he I, sadly we, we we have a culture in this part of the world where we don't necessarily um we don't necessarily reward reward the efforts of our uh, of our uh, journalists of our footballers and all of that but i was so pleased when he got awarded recently at the nigeria france awards in paris organized by ogb sports and some other uh, some other um sponsors and and people and i feel that that should be like the minimum we should do for for journalists who have contributed to the development and also to the growth of nigeria football one way or the other through their reporting their coverage and all of that for many generations of for many generations above me the likes of that race some women allow are the the good to journalists back in the day but for me it was calling sudo um Sao Keleji, um Emeka Yadike and and um, Sam Aldo. Those are the people I grew up reading most of their work with aside from that of my dad actually. So those are the people that I actually like read their work so when I was growing up. So I don't know if Mr. Shina is on is online at the moment, although I do sent him a message privately so he could join us for today's conversation. We can start today's conversation on the road. I believe we're drawing closer to the African. I don't know what everybody's what your what you feel the chances are for the spragus, but the signs are not so great at the moment. Well, it's not about be trying to be negative or anything here, but let's call it for what it is. The signs are not so great. But funny enough, we always have this issue of when it's actually when you're actually giving up on the team. That's when the team actually does a lot of magic. If they are, if that's going to be the case it's not a bad thing but it's quite sad also that we won't be watching the game on dstv as we've done over the last um over the last decade or so or more we're going to be watching through nt and other free to air channels i don't know what you guys think about it but personally i feel it's not a bad idea to an extent but it just shows but, but whether the free to air channels and nt themselves are equipped to actually show these games in hd quality or give us an experience like we've never had with on um I would never have before. That's another debate for another day. But nonetheless, the Afcon is coming. But sadly, it will be on DSTV like with many of us expected. But nonetheless, whatever channels we feel we could watch it, I personally will watch it. I actually will be, I'm looking forward to the game against Ivory Coast because there's a lot of history there. It's a lot of um I think there's a lot of there's a there's a kind of like a, a what I call it's not a payback though, but we have unfinished business because considering that the last time we played Ivy Coast in 2008, um, they beat us. And somehow they got to the semi finals after beating us. When they beat us in 2006 in the quarter, quarter finals, I mean, sorry, in the semi finals, they got to the final. So even though we did have our own revenge in 2013, and we eventually won it. But the group stage, we have an unfinished business there. So that's the game I'm actually looking forward to. Frank Kessy, um Evan 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 Indica yeah Evan Indica Sergio Rie um Simon and Drinka these are players Sam uh, Sebastian Hala these are players I'm looking forward to watching we uh, team come up against we have our own victors you know we have our own um 
Victor Boniface and the rest of them. So this will be an exciting African tournament. So we're still waiting for Mr. Shino Okeleji to begin today's conversation. I've sent him a request, but I don't know if, if he's online at the moment. He's online, he could just he could just come on to begin to this conversation. But if he's not online at the moment, maybe someone else will send a request. Maybe we could have a conversation on the AFCON or football generally from the Nigerian perspective. Um, I think I've seen a request here. So maybe I might just accept it before Mr. Shino comes on for now. Um, ah, Mr. Feedback, I see you. Feedback, Neliho, I see you guys. Everybody who's on this online on this live, I see you. I appreciate you for the support over the years and all that for your encouraging words and all that. But Mr. Shina College is our guest today, so give us an AFCON from the perspective of a journalist. What it feels like to cover an AFCON, the experiences, the challenges. He's supposed to share that with us once he comes on. But um we haven't seen him. I haven't seen him yet online so maybe i might have, have to send on a request again still so he could join us um, it's a shame now if you can see me you can just quite maybe you could send a request i've sent a request on my own parts but if you could send the request on your parts to be good so we could start today's conversation that's much further ado mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thanks, bro. I appreciate. Thanks for the word. I appreciate the feedback. I appreciate. So, Sheena, I see you. I've sent a request. I don't know if you could join in now so we could start today's conversation. Okay. Sent a request. So you'll be joining us live any moment from now. So, like I said, Mr. Shina is a seasoned journalist. He's covered many Afghan tournaments, many World Cup tournaments. And it's been a pleasure to to hear from him, to get it, or what it's like to cover the Afghan tournament. Mr. Shina, I don't know if you're online at the moment. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Seems to be having network issues at the moment. Seems to be having network issues at the moment. Um. Okay, can you hear me? Well, I can't. I can't see you. I can't hear you at the moment, though. Can you see me? Sashina, can you see me? Hello? Okay. Good, good morning, sir. Good morning. No, I'm old school now. Start Nah. Good morning. Good morning, Avin. How, how, how is your base? How is France? How is the family? And Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Everything is fine. The family is good. It's a new year. It's an Afghan year. So everything is everything is good. Thanks. And yours? You know, uh, it's going great at the moment. But you know, I, I, I've always we've always been seeing the perspective of the Afghans from from the positions of players, coaches, and the rest of them. We hardly see it from the perspective of the journalists. I know you don't do vlogs. <laughs> But maybe if you were in this time, maybe you would have been doing vlogs now for your AFCON experiences. But before we go to, into the AFCON discussion proper, <clears throat> just give us an insight on who Mr. Shina Okiriji is and how he got into journalism. Okay. Uh, my name is Oluwa Shina Okiriji. How did I get into journalism? Um, one of my um, cousins is late now. Um, his name is uh, Tajuddin Adebowale Tiame, whichever one he chooses to call himself now. So because he's always arguing like, is this, is that. So, but anyway, he, he used to um, buy shoot magazines, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, these are old magazines. I mean, some of them are still 
um, publishing, and of course, World Soccer Magazine, um, yeah. March Magazine, some of them back in the day. So I used to read, and in the back of newspapers, Nigerian newspapers like Daily Times, and a um, couple of um, newspapers back then. So that's how I just, um, you know, got interest to follow football. And funnily, my nickname um, when I was growing up, because <laughs> I mean, I've, I've not, I don't think I've actually said this publicly, but when I was growing up, I, I supported my, um, sorry, Liverpool because of um, um, Brand. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because of um, Kenny Daglish. Kenny Daglish was the first man I oh, saw his poster yeah. back then, you know, in his, towards the end of yeah. his career for Liverpool. And um, I think John Banks later came, Bruce Gobbler, uh, mm. uh, Ian, yeah. Rush, Ian Rush as well. So those were the those were the people I actually got to know first before the introduction of Maradona and the rest of them, you know, or or the me or Rashidi and the rest of them. So that was how I got mm -hmm. into my interest in football started actually. Um and growing up it was a matter of I was either gonna be a journalist, I was gonna be a lawyer. I wanted to put people in jail. I wanted to put corrupt corrupt people in jail. <laughs> you know, because I was growing up in Nigeria and I could see that every time I'm sitting around my cousins or my uncle or my um and the conversation is always around how money meant for development has gone missing you know and it wasn't yeah. it was like people were not accountable so i was going to be i was going to be a lawyer and put people behind bars if the system was okay you know so those were the things that yeah. pushed me so it was a matter of being a journalist to tell the stories of um africa not necessarily sports in particular but it was there that i just realized that you know what i could do sport i could write sport and then by and large I met people along the way, um, Fumi Yoda, um, Kayode Tijani, <laughs> Wale Opatola, um, Shegmode Bami, you know, a couple of people yeah. who actually um, gave me a chance then, you know, to, to start writing and to start talking. And that's just how it all started. Wow. You've called some some prominent names in the in the media industry to be honest so many important personalities but aside all of this um you are into journalism now that's from your from your history now tell us what was it like what was the first game you actually you remember covering <laughs> uh, ah, oh boy i think it has to be if Oli Opatola is yeah maybe you two can remember. It has to be some of the Super Four in the early no no no. Now Super Four was later. It was um, yes. Nigeria Nigeria ninety nine, Nigeria ninety nine. Okay. Yeah, Nigeria okay. ninety nine. Yeah. I think it must be Nigeria ninety nine because the other ones were just observing. You know, we will go get a pass to get into the stadium. But I think it was Nigeria mm. ninety nine. And um, there's this I don't know you remember you know Dudu Orume. Dudu Orume. Yes, I know Dudu Orume. Okay, Barista yeah. Dudu Orume. Um, he was doing best of football. And he had best of football. And then he had a magazine called um, Master Sport. Master Sport. Mm. Uh, multi, sorry, Multi Sport. Multi Sport. Multi Sport publication. Okay. So um, I came in as an IT student then with Dudu Orume's publication in 1999 through Kyle I was already doing, um, I was with Kyle Tijani. And then I came to. Oh. Um, Kyle Tijani had a program on um, LTV then. It's called Sports uh, Extra. No, it was it Sports Extra? I think it was Sports Extra. Yes, I think it was Sports Extra. Mm. Sports Extra. Yeah, yeah, I think it was Sports Extra. Um, with uh, my um, secondary schoolmate, Tayo Gushaya. Tayo Gushaya. Tayo Gushaya is with um, Afro Sports now. He used to be with um, Sportsville. He's now with um, so it was there. The first game I went to cover must be a game in Nigeria 99, I think, because there was a, and this is a very funny story, there was, there's a guy, he has an accreditation, I didn't have an accreditation, so the guy was always okay. in the office, he was an editor, so he would just give me his accreditation and say, oh boy, yeah. go watch, go stadium, you know, stadium, our office then was uh, yeah. off Ogunlano, and Ogunlano to stadium yeah. is just about 10 minutes walk or 15 minutes walk, if you go through the back, that's your gamba, and then you go through the back, so Mr. Okara, Emmanuel Okara, he gave me his accreditation to go to the oh. stadium to watch a game yeah. from for Nigeria 99. So it was a matter of, uh, we did not check in our accreditation or, what, or, or what's going on. But I remember an incident that happened. Yeah. I didn't, they didn't let me get an accreditation. Then the accreditation had closed and all that. And then I remember I said I was an ID student. And then um, yes. this man, Dan Lajibako, was the 
head of transportation or whatnot for Nigeria 99. And I didn't know anything. I didn't know any better. So apparently, he arranged some few journalists to come to the stadium to tell them about Nigeria's preparation for the Nigeria 99 World Cup, under 20 World Cup. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know I wasn't mm -hmm. supposed to ask a question. I didn't know everything was arranged. This was, the, this was my introduction to, to media in Nigeria. I keep forgetting mm -hmm. this. I said, when I'm writing a book, I'm going to put this particular story. And we were there. And um, then Lady Baku, some journalists that I wouldn't mention their names now, but some of them are still in the industry. Mm -hmm. Some of them are still in the industry. I mean, and we were there. They brought the bosses. It was the, what's that boss? You know, that big boss they used for Nigeria 99. Um, that tra for transport, for, for the teams, it was the team bosses. Um, they, okay. They, ABC used them. All these transport companies used them. I forgot the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. particular yeah. name of this, this brand. So I was there, yes. and then we were, the man was telling us that, look, this is the boss that will convey the teams that will be participating at the World Cup. And um, mm -hmm. they will send some to Bauchi, send some to Kano, send some to Enugu. And then um, we were like, wow, it was Marco Polo bosses. They were Marco Polo bosses. Okay, yeah, Marco, Marco Polo. Polo bosses. So I'm like, wow, you know, like this is interesting. I haven't seen bosses like this. We went inside, we check and check. And then apparently they said, any question? I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to ask questions. As a journalist, you're supposed to ask questions. Mm -hmm. I'm just fresh out of school. I'm doing my industrial attachment. Mm -hmm. I was eager to, ah, this is Mr. Della Dibako. I used to watch him on telly, you know, uh, Master Sports or what's that program? I don't know, on NTA. So sports let me focus. Add Somebody says Sports Focus. That's how it is, yeah, it's Sports Focus, yes. Now, for, okay. for, for, for Della Dibako, I think he used to do Master Sports or something. So for me, this is a guy I've yes. watched on telly as a kid. Let me ask him this question. As soon as I raised up my hand, everyone looked at me like, what's wrong with this guy? So I said, um, so sir, what's going to happen to these bosses at the end of the tournament? And they were silent, like, uh, what was he asking? And, you know, they weren't prepared for that. So the guy was like, eh, 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 and then he explained something. I think he explained it away, and I can't remember. And as soon as we finished, for me, I had a story. Yeah, they're going to use this boss. This boss this is one of its kind, blah, blah, blah. And then... Um, it was shocking. It was shocking because when I was in school, our teacher used to say something to me about, I'm sorry, our lecturer used to say something about brown envelope. I didn't know what brown envelope meant. I had no idea what brown envelope was. And then um, I just realized that these journalists were going to one corner and the people I came with from the same organization, they were angry with me. They were just saying stuff to me like, oh, why did you ask questions? IT students, who sent you? Why did you ask questions? I'm like, yo, but we, we are here, sir. We, we needed to ask him questions. And they got angry. So obviously, they were going to share Balam and me. Yeah. I opened my big mouth to go and talk in their opinion. And they said, I just today, I'm not going to get anything. <laughs> They're not going to get anything. So back to your question. I think the first game I covered was Nigeria Paraguay at the um, under 20 World Cup live game that I actually covered was in one of those um, under 20 tournaments. And after the first game, the yeah. second game, I think I had issues with the accreditation. Obviously, it wasn't mine. And then I had to do, I had to go sort out myself. And um, yeah, that was my first thing before I now went and cover Super 4, Nigeria Super 4, in what I think um, metamorphosed into the best four in Nigeria, top Nigeria Premier League, yes. where then we had Sonia yeah. Beji, Sheyu Gusonya, um, Ishola Shaibu, Eric Ejiofo, some of the top players then in the Nigerian League, you know, Katina United came, banging. We had teams then in the Nigerian League that were giving other teams a run for their money. So those were the early days of my journalism. Okay. So after you went through, after that experience, mm. what was your first AFCON tournament that you actually covered? Um, in To be present, the, the first one I covered was Mali 2002, but I wasn't in Mali. I was covering from okay. Nigeria, like, you know, and Wally Opatola was mm -hmm. there. So the first one for me was Tunisia 2004. Um, yeah, 2000, okay. Tunisia 2004, we flew in from Nigeria. I traveled with the supporters club. You know, they had a chartered flight. We went to Monastir and we were on the plane. When we when the pilot told us that bad news, guys, we said, are we not landing? He said, no, Morocco are taking the lead, but hey, come on, share the Super Eagles. Nigeria is going to come back, blah, blah, blah. We landed in Monastir mm -hmm. to find out that Nigeria had lost the game one nil to uh, Morocco. Oh. That was the opening game of our Afcon. That's my first Afcon experience. And the supporters club were not smiling at all. They were like, ah, yeah. Maybe it was because they weren't there. Maybe if they were there, they would drum support. Yeah, you know, stuff like true. that. Yeah, mm. so that's my first Afcon. Um, 
brilliant AFCON 2004. It was a great tournament, an eye opener, and um, um, rest is so. Um, uh, what's his name? The former AIT guy, Felix Okube. He was there with Laurent yeah. Kerr. With Laurent Kerr. I remember I was losing to Tunisia, and the Tunisians were beating us. They were outside the stadium. They were um, after, outside the stadium in Rades. The, the fans. You know, during the game, they were threatening us. After the game, they were beating us. Any black person they see, they were attacking. I remember Laurent Kerr saying, I'm Cameroon, wow. Cameroonian. And then, um, Felix <laughs> Okubi to say, yeah, Cameroon with him. <laughs> they attacked us. And it was, it, was, wow. it, was, it was funny, but it was a good experience. It was a good experience to, to actually cover the Afghan um, and meet some of the players that, you know, you've always watched on telly, JJ Okocha, um, and other Nigerian top stars at Afghan in 2004. Okay. Now, that what was like the challenge you had while you were covering that tournament in 2004? Compared um, to maybe the challenges that you probably will face now? No, I think back then, um, the media, um, you know, this is 2004. These were the days of floppy disk, you know. And oh, mind yes. you, <laughs> yeah, true. Um, and that iPhone had a lot of memories for me because. Um, I went as the editor of the first all sports website in Nigeria. It's called NigeriaSport.com. Um, a guy, um, mm. Wilson Bodish, he, he was a photographer. We, Wilson is quite big, a top guy. He was a photographer with um, um, Ovation Magazine in London. So he came to Nigeria. Then some people had appeared on our show. I think he met some guys, Tunde Ade, Tunde Ade and um, Goki I was <clears throat> freelancing for their website. It's called gstars.com. So I was writing for them. So when they came on New Dawn on 10, that I was appearing then, that I was doing New Dawn on 10. Um, I think Wilson had had a conversation with them. They were doing, um, um, what's it called now? It's like the ovation of online where they talk about happenings mm. in the UK, JJC crew, Solek crew, some of those people who were doing something. It was, a, mm. it, it was more or less a website. So I was doing the sports for them. So it was there they met with Wilson. When Wilson was coming to Nigeria, they spoke to Wilson about, you know, he told them about the idea. The website was designed like the BBC, to be honest. The only mm. thing different there was the color. So I was the, Wilson came to Nigeria. We started the website together. Um, our first job was the All-Africa Games in 2003. And um, 2004, by the time 2004 came, I had to go and cover the AFCON for that website. So Wally Opatola too was with me. I mean... Practically, my start was with Wally, and uh, to, an, yeah. to a large extent, um, Omotai Ogushe as well. So um, then, what challenges we had then was that a lot of Nigerian journalists were not really using the computer, and I think most of them will write okay. on the, they will they will write their stories on, on on the paper, and then they will go to a newsroom where they can type, or either they give it to a typist. So for us, we wow. were like we. I had a laptop. I mean, it was like a big thing to have a laptop. So my stories mm -hmm. would have been done on the on the laptop in the mid, in the media center, media tribune. We were typing. Wale would go to the mix zone. Chuku, Christian Chuku was our coach then, and then Wale would go to mm -hmm. the Wale would go to um what's it called? Wale would go to the mix zone. Whilst me, I'm writing in the media center. There were only five computers in the news in the in the media center. Five. With a, with a, wow. yeah, five. So then you used to use the cable to connect, you know, the LAN cable to connect your laptop to send. But who is going to let you have a LAN cable? They were, well, are the Arab journalists, French journalists, you know, English journalists, different people. So Wally will go, then wh why is the story is done? Nigeria beat Bene to make group stage, whatever. Wally will be in the mix zone. It will, then, you know, that small Nokia phone, I will just text me what you could have said. Sometimes quickly we just scribble and then I'll just be oh, typing, oh. okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. then I'll put the byline from Monastil or from Sparks, Uluashino Keleji and Wale Opatola, boom, and then we'll put it there. So that's how we were operating. So then Nigerian journalists, um, for me, I needed the internet for just five minutes because my story is done. I just needed to plug it and then get out of the desk, or rather copy on the floppy disk. Sometimes I've done it on the laptop, copy on the floppy disk, go to the desktop insert it, mm. lay the page, open your website, post, put pictures, do everything, and then go. You understand? So those were the days for us. Like, how can you have over 100 journalists in the media mm. tribune, and then you only have about five, six computers? 
So, and the, listen, the six computers or seven computers, I think, I think it was about seven. The seven computers, two will be in Arabic keyboard, three will be in French, yeah. and the other two will be in English. So it means over 100 journalists are fighting for <laughs> five computers. And um, yeah, and of course, that's how it was then. It was a lot difficult. Unlike now where okay. there is Wi-Fi and everything, and you can use your computer to log on. Wow. So you had the advantage of a laptop while every other person will probably get their stories later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was it. Okay. So after the AFCON, you went to subsequent ones. But from the ones you've went so far, for, for the mediums you've also like covered for, what has been the best AFCON in your opinion that you've covered? Ah. <laughs> ah. That's... I'll say 2013. 2013, maybe because Nigeria won. Maybe because Nigeria okay. won. That's, very, that's the buyer's one to stay, to be honest. That's, oh. that's the buyer's one because as a journalist, especially when you're covering your country, you want to see your team go all the way. There were so many things behind the scene in 2013 that if it comes out now, some people will say, ah, somebody should be pawned, somebody should be called, somebody should be... There were oh. so many things, you know, oh. in the build up to the tournament, the tournament proper and everything. So from a Nigerian perspective, the 2013 AFCON was for me, a, 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 a good one. The 2006 and 2000 and 2006 and 2008 ones were also nice um, because then we had top, top players, man. You had Drogba, Eto, Mbuma. Mbuma, I think Mbuma was still there. Um, we had, we still, you know, we had top, top African players. It's the AFCON clubs that are making noise in England, in Europe, but the players are coming for the yeah. tournament. Then we had players you know, shuffling between Europe and Africa just to catch up with the game and come back. It was a glorious tournament. So I would say 2013 for me because Nigeria won. But in 2006 and 2000, 2006 and 2008 won. 2006 in Egypt and 2008 in Ghana had some of the top, top talent from the African continent. By 2013, I think the tournament started having issues. Remember, there was 2012, there was 2013, so it came back to back. Yes. Um, some top teams didn't yes. qualify, so not to water down what Nigeria no. achieved in 2013, um, but by 2012, and playing another tournament less than 10 months later, I think it was too much to ask for the play, um, of the players, in my opinion. Mm. Um, like I said, mm. not to water down what Nigeria did or anything. But I just think um, those tournaments, back in 2006 2008 and 2010 top top terrific terrific tournament man it was it was good so for me i'll say the 2013 because nigeria won but 20, 2006 and 2008 because of the caliber of players that we had in in, in action okay uh, now in after that 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 tournament um mm. Which tournament, in your opinion, would you look at and say from the beginning it looked like Nigeria were going to win? But sadly, that was not the case. Ah, we had many of them, man. Like, um, <laughs> hey, Nigeria. Ah, what Nigeria has done to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, 20, I think on home soil 2000, before, before okay. the 2004 one that I covered, uh, because I was covering that one too from the office, the 2000 tournament. Um, the 2000, I think 2000, 2002, and the 2000, and uh, uh, which one did we have? The 2006 one, I think we had a good team. The 2006 one, too, we had a good team. Um, you know, uh, that's that's John Michael Obi's first AFCON, uh, 2006. Yes, yes, okay. yes, um, because then we, we could. We had Tai Tai on the left. We had, we had, we had players, man. We had, we had strong players everywhere you look in the Nigerian department. Attack, midfield, defense. We had strong players, and so 2000 and I'll say 2000 on home soil. 2002 in Mali. On 2000 and no, not, not 2004. 2006. 2006. Okay. I think those were the three tournaments that actually felt like Nigeria should have won easily, in my opinion, because. Um, I felt like they were, they had a very strong squad. They have a very good team. Um, the players were were all in it, and everything was meant to go well for Nigeria. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Okay. Now you, I, I during my my last one of my last posts I made about Victor Vina's um, comments on the 2008 tournament. You made a statement that saying 2000 and the promises of 2004, 2006 came crashing in 2008. 
And then in 2010, you said something like Amadou was trying to like bring diplomacy to the team and all that. Now, personally, I've always said that 2018 included. And in 2010, there was just something that was not just right still with that team. Yes, we missed Ikechuku Uche, yes. We missed his, um, his industry and all of that because mm. he was actually a very important player to the way we played. But what else do you think made us not go far in that 2010 outcome? You know, um, Obina laid the foundation. You know, there's a different thing when a player speaks and when a journalist yes. speaks. Some of the things that we know, obviously we know from team officials, we hear from players, we also observe when we go for training, when we go for their practices and yeah. all that. So, mm -hmm. I think generally um, there was there was that problem with the um, new generation of players coming through to the Super Eagles mm -hmm. and okay. some of the old ones who many felt like were past their prime. So, and when it came to when, when you have too many players that you can select from, there will always be headache and then there will always be, um, there will be imbalance. There will be, there will be that, you know, grumbling of discontent among the players. Some of them will feel like they should start a game. Some of them feel like they, they shouldn't start a game. Some feel like, yo, we sacrificed a lot for um, the country. We should get game time and whatnot. And I remember those were the days where players would decide when to come to camp, when they won't come. So some of the younger generation felt like, you, you know what, well, we had done enough to, to, um, to get starting position in the, in the starting sports in the first team. But it's the choice of the manager. The manager has to pick. And then there was a problem that I think was happening back then, you know, the NFF or rather the NFA, whatever they were then, they used to do something. They would say they've spoken to the to the to the team but what they did what they often do was they will travel to the uk speak to a couple of selected players and said they've spoken to the team and some of the some of the young players or some of the other players felt like oh so because i'm playing in italy or because i'm playing in um, israel or because i'm playing in france i'm not considered to be important because what they would do is they would meet like maybe four five players in the premier league and then so some of those things were actually brewing and remember as well that in that afcon in 2010 that you mentioned um for betty books they were there were multiple problems for Betty Books. Um, you know, like he came, he had a German mentality. Remember, it was that same period that mm -hmm. Dominic um, Iofa walked him out of a training because he came late. <laughs> there were so many problems in the. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. He came late. Um, Dominic Iofa sent him away and said, Will you do that in Germany? There was a big fire. I think Dominic faced disciplinary action with the Federation then. And also, it was a period where he came out and he didn't hide the fact that he preferred a GD over Enyama. You know, he, he was it was a big toss to them too, but Enyama had to Enyama had to respect him and um, it was a choice of the coach. Uh, not that Enyama was bad. He said he wanted a big, a bigger oh. goalkeeper. And you know he's German as well. Yeah. And then he came with his assistant, um former World Cup winner Thomas Asla, I think. No, Thomas Asla didn't win the World Cup, did he? No. I think Euro winner I can't remember now my brain is but oh. Still... Yeah, he came with about he came with three assistants from Germany, you know, and I remember oh, I think this was okay. I think this was the one that um, Daniel Amokachi pulled out of the backroom staff. Then Amok, I think Amokachi, yes, Amokachi did. I think Amokachi pulled out and all that. So there were so many problems, and then some of the for him the key thing for Betty was fitness. You know, you couldn't hide injuries or whatnot. You understand? And there were those who felt like he didn't understand African football. Who, he didn't do this. So Ghana was. A big disaster. So we're coming in 2010 now under Amodu after going through the qualifying. Amodu too faced his own problem because some of the big players were making excuses for qualifiers during friendly games and all that. So some of those things were brewing in the minds of those players who felt like they were going out for qualifiers. Some players shouldn't shouldn't have participated or whatnot. So by the time they got to Angola for that AFCON, um, to be fair, to be honest, in my opinion, despite the defeat to Egypt. I think they still had a good tournament before losing to Ghana in the semis. I think they lost to Ghana in the semifinals or so. So um, Amadou lost his job. So what Amadou was doing then was some people felt like Amadou favored some players, you know. And then mm -hmm. there are those who don't have respect for, um, there are those who, who also didn't have respect for local manager. They felt like, ah, who is this man, you know. But Amadou had earned his stripes. Amadou has done so much. Amadou is, Amadou Keshi, in my opinion, are two of the coaches that Nigeria treated poorly. Nigeria treated them badly. 
you know, they, they, they grind results out of nothing. They were dealing with players who were not, you know, some of them were not really, some of them make excuses not to participate. So they were, there was that faction. There was that divide. There was that thing going on within the team. And like I said, some of the players might come out now and say, oh, no, he's lying, he's lying. But my guy, it was going on. It was going on. You know, the, the day we lost to... So anyway, I'm going to do... I'm going to try it as much as possible to build the bridge. I'm already somebody that we... I'm already can't hide that. He likes certain players. And the manager is allowed to do that. Those players whom he felt like yes. they, can, they can fight for him, they will... Even if seven of them, even if it's five of them, they can go and change things in the team and all that. So some of them felt like, oh, some strikers were our model boys, some guys were our model boys and all that. But those things were there. But our model was trying as much as possible to pick the best. That's our model for you. Our model does not care if your agent is uh, coming from this and that. Our model will pick his best team. You see that one that they have forced on him. Those players will come in five minutes, ten minutes to the end, though. That's a model for you. Mm. And a model will tell you, my mm. guy, I'm not asking you to go and score. Go and do, you know. So that's what that was what Amadou was for. Like he was a complete decent guy, in my opinion, you know. He and Keshi, in my opinion. So I think those were the problems that went they went into that tournament in 2008. It was all the entire Betty Book saga. Some of the young players were coming in, the team was divided. Betty himself didn't really have control or grasp of the team or knowledge of African football. There were just so many multiple problems, multiple layered problems that had the team. And by the time they went to the AFCON in 2010, the Amodu was doing his own thing. That defeat to Ghana, in my opinion, I think Amodu should have gone to the World Cup in 2010. But this is Nigeria we are talking about. Yes. Fans make mm-hmm. so many demands. They want their team to play certain ways. They want their team to do certain things. Mm-hmm. By the time we went to the World Cup in 2010, it was shambles, complete shambles. And that's why we had a fight. There was a big fight in the dressing room after we lost to South Korea. Yeah, there was a big fight. Some of them, are, maybe some of them will listen to this later or they will hear. There was a big fight between, <laughs> between one of the players who felt like he said, he said, and I quote, he said, him and the particular striker, they fought, they did everything, but this coach could not even play them. He didn't start them in this tournament. He went for some of the names, that, some of the big names, you know. And for me, I think Las Lagabak was a huge problem. He shouldn't, he shouldn't have gotten the job. He shouldn't have been the manager of Nigeria. That guy spent the entire tournament okay. putting he couldn't even pronounce Nigeria. Nigeria, whenever I'm talking to him post-match, he's saying Nigeria, Nigeria. And I'm like, you can't even pronounce the country. <laughs> Somebody said it was his accent. I said, get off. The least you can do is pronounce the name of the country properly. The country you're managing. Oh, yeah. He was an holiday yeah. from Sweden and they gave him the job because he had this, um, what was that thing? Excel, Microsoft Excel or whatever. They said it's presentation, PowerPoint presentation. Yes. He knocked them off and yeah. they gave him the job. So some of the players felt like yeah. uh, when he came, those who didn't like Amo, what Amadou did in Angola were celebrating. So by the time he came now and he now did almost something different again. Yeah, like, I don't know this guy is a crazy guy. He didn't know our team. He didn't know this. He didn't know that. So there was... It, it, it saddens my heart because the fans are always outside. They don't know what's going on on the inside. You know, there were so many problems. Like, they, they, <laughs> oh my God, 2010 World Cup. Ah, no, no, no. That one alone. That one alone, you know, we had injuries. And remember, that was when Rabi Wafolabi was played in a certain position, maybe left back and all that. Tai Tai was left back. Yeah. Ederson too had his own injury concerns. And then there was a divide. Some people said, this one is this person's um, team. This one is oh, so messy. And there's no way Nigeria were going to fly. Super Eagles weren't going to fly at that point. The issues were just too much. And it saddened my heart because some of the top journalists and senior journalists who knew what was going on weren't really reporting what was going on. And um, when you work for a certain organization, there are certain things you can't report or you can't write about, which I understand. And But the truth of the matter is the truth about Nigeria. We've practically um, self-destructed in most of the tournaments we went for because there was no, there was, there was no, there was no, there was no, I don't know, coercion. There was no team spirit. There was nothing good enough. Some people just wanted to play for themselves. Some people didn't care. Some people felt like they have the ears of the coach. They are, they are these, they are that. So it's it's sad because Nigerians are always shouting on on TV or anywhere they are, thinking that the Super League should perform. But some of those problems actually add the teams back in tournaments. Okay. Um, recently, the Afcon now will not be shown on DSTV, and many houses, many businesses, they use DSTV. So the access we accessing the Afcon now is through NTA and through um, free to air channels. We know we all know the NTA standard of broadcasting at the moment is not 
of the at all. So I don't know what people think about the AFCON. Where do you think the AFCON now ranks in terms of visibility, viewership, perception in the world football? That we, we cannot be having the AFCON on our on DSCD, for instance. Even you, some UK broadcasters are not even showing it. Um, well, with that matter, first and foremost, you asked the question about the AFCON. The AFCON is highly respected now. A lot of people take it seriously now. The players are fighting and they understand that players have to go for the AFCON in Africa. It's a huge tournament. It's similar to the Euros in Europe, so Copa Americas in South America, and of course the Asian Cup as well. Um, the CONCACAF to come and say their own tournament is also good. So the AFCON is a huge tournament, highly respected, top-ranked tournament. Um, in terms of um, the TV problem, I think it's just an issue that is general, that's across board. It's just not Nigeria. Um, it's not just Nigeria. Um, and then remember that a lot of things happen behind the scene that a lot of people don't know. There are so many controversies surrounding the TV rights. The TV right now, teams, um, countries used to deal with a certain, um, you know, organization, and now they have to go through a third party. The, the way the rights are given, I just think, um, I'm, I don't work for anywhere, any TV or cable station, but the truth of the matter is some of them felt like they couldn't pay what they were being asked to pay. And also there was a contractual okay. agreement that was hanging in there who suffered eventually will be the viewers. The viewers who rely on, you know, um, DSTV to follow the tournaments, who rely on um, a whole lot of these channels to watch the channel. In my opinion, I just think people get emotional, people get sentimental about these things. DSTV are running the business. And if you, as the viewer, you feel like they're not giving you what you want, you move. Other people will say, why should we move? We bought their decoder, but they are going to only show you what they can afford to show you. Um, in Europe here, yeah, you pay for, you, there's pay, pay TV, there's an opportunity for you to pay um, for certain things that you want. Pay-per-view is there. Um, if I want to watch UFC fights, I have to pay certain things to watch the UFC fight uh, on particular stations and all that. So the, 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 the way things are structured in Africa, especially in Nigeria as well, is a bit difficult. Um, people don't really have the money or the, the resources to actually get premium packages to watch TV. So now for, for multi-choice or DSTV, whatever they are called, if they have to pay top top dollars for the tournament that they are being asked it means they will hike the fee again and you are, ah, these people they are wicked they are other i've seen some posts about so, from people that i respect so. a lot they don't understand how these things work there's so much that people are not saying that the older of the right now are not saying that the people in bstv2 are not saying to people out there but the truth is that when it comes to tv rights people are saying oh but it shows premier league they show us this of course, you want the best quality football. Premier League is the, undoubtedly the best in the world. They will pay premium for that because they know that you people will come and watch it. If for the AFCON, I don't think it's because the AFCON is not rated. I just think it's because of those in charge of TV. I'm not in charge of TV. I'm not in charge of CAF. I'm not in charge of the TV rights and all that. But there are problems that are just fundamental to some of these things about the rights and is affecting the people who suffer are subscribers who don't know what to do next. But for those in Nigeria, mm -hmm. I understand Afro Sports TV will be showing it, you know, um, Afro Sports TV, I think um, Star Times 2 will be showing, I think, um, Star Times will show. I think those are the, those are the two, um, you know, uh, people that I'm aware that will probably be showing it from a Nigeria perspective. But the AFCON is highly rated. The thing should be on TV. Nigerians should enjoy the best of AFCON. And whether you like it or not, the NCA that will condemn, the NCA, apologies. The NTA that somebody was trying, no nah, somebody was trying to call, I think. So the NTA that we condemn today might just be the savior for tomorrow. You understand? So um, you know, the somebody saying it's not the subscriber business. What happens in the background? Exactly, and that's why if you don't feel comfortable about what they are giving you, you can go elsewhere and get your thing sorted out. Um, the, the people you are blaming or fighting. The people you are fighting or blaming, they are doing business. They are not doing. They are not doing. Uh, they are not doing emotional business. <laughs> the money is going in. Mm. If they feel like they are being yeah. priced out of the rights, if they feel like they are being priced out of the right, they have a right to do their business. I stopped subscribing to DSTV a long time ago, and it was for personal reason. I don't feel like whenever I'm in Nigeria, I'm enjoying what I should be enjoying. I have Netflix, and I'm fine with Netflix. Once I have internet, I can watch whatever I want to watch. I, what I have here, I take back home, I watch and I go. Not a lot of people have that luxury, but I'm just telling you that with the way things are going now, people are moving away from cable TV. People are going into smart, you know, smart TV. You buy, you pay for what you watch you, and you go away. You are, you are disconnected when you don't pay. But DSTV is the only place that people want to watch movies. They want to watch 
football, they want this, they want to pay the same fee for all across field, and it's a very, very difficult thing. So those people doing that's why you see them, they, you see them, they are paying so much for the pre, um, for some of the content they are showing you, they are paying for rights and all that. They will continue to hike their fee because it's going to really affect people who are subscribing at the end of the day. It's just unfortunate that the subscriber that they want suffering now and the information didn't really go out early enough for people to know. True. True. This aspect is not actually being talked about enough, but it's what it is. It's business at the end of the day. If they know that, okay, yes, they're not going to make money from this or they are not going to benefit, they will, They have no reason to like get cave into the Uh, sorry, I think your line. I think I'm um, your line. Something is wrong with your line. Sorry. Did you get my last question? No, I didn't. I think I was talking over you because you're. Okay, I said. Okay, I said the the super egos have come under scrutiny for their recent performances over the last one year. The coach is also a a huge doubt in terms of his. He has come under scrutiny too for his managerial style and all of that. What have you made of the Super Eagles current team? And how far do you think we can go in the Ivory Coast? I got it. <laughs> Look, it's, um, it's unfortunate. But the last time I was this pessimistic, Nigeria went on to win the Afghan in 2013. But it is, it's a different coach. It's a different team and it's a different time. And remember what I said about 2013, being back to back 2012, 2020, um, 2013 tournament. So, um, and we didn't have, I think we didn't have um, Egypt, we didn't have Cameroon or something in that 2013 tournament as well. So it's a different time and everything. Unfortunately, um, the choice of, I think we, we, we spent so much time talking about how we employ coaches in Nigeria, you know. Um, Pesero was a red flag from the beginning. Um, remember the former NFL uh, leadership, they thought he was good enough because he came highly recommended by Jose Mourinho and as a Venga in their world. And um, you, need to, oh. you need to watch who is coming. Does he understand your football? Does he understand the kind of chaos that you are dealing with? So I don't think those were the things that were considered before hiring Jose Pesero. He was on 70,000 grand a week. Um, sorry, a month. $70,000 a month. Um, huge money to pay, and who are you paying this money to? The former coach of Venezuela, who left about going unpaid for over ten months, who was who had really shown you what he was coming to do when he rejected your first offer or your first discussion. You know, it was supposed to be at the last Afcon to observe the team, and they yes. rejected, saying he didn't agree terms with Nigeria. So I think there was a fundamental issue from the beginning, and then when he came, um, look, you don't expect, you don't. I think there was a problem from Genefro that still transferred to Joseph Pesero and it's about how do you set up your team and you know Nigerians always believe like ah we have too many strikers we should be winning every tournament the selection process was poor in terms of how do you actually scout for your players how do you follow your players it's as if some players too have become like you know what whatever happens I'll get in the team do you understand and then the mm -hmm. it's like every mm -hmm. manager that applied for Nigerian job just say to the NFF I don't like midfielders and they'll give him the job because when you look at Genetro, every time he announces his coach, we have maybe four or five midfielders. This Jose Pesero is doing the same thing. And the problem that I have completely with it is that he can't even convince himself about what, what his style is or what he's trying to do. You understand? So it makes it difficult for you as a fan yeah. watching. You are like this. And it's, it explains why some people are upset, you know. And for me, this is the first time we are going into a tournament worse than 2013 because in 2013 the reason why a lot of us had were pessimistic was the fact that it, Keshi didn't pick certain players and then Keshi was going with six debut um like 10 10 12 debutants so, you know like what was this man thinking but he's the coach we are just emotional fans some of us are journalists who don't like the face of the coach or who didn't like the face of the players and you're angry and all that no but when you look at the team and how they are performing because i remember the first time i actually saw Keshi's team up close and personal apart from when we we're playing in Calabar, all those qualifying time and all that, was in Vene um, the game in Miami against Venezuela. Um, oh. I, I think 
Um, that was the goal that no, that was where Nosai Gabo scored one, you know, rocket like that. So I could see yes. how Kechi was trying to set up his team. And his problem with the older generation, his problem with the older players was like they had felt like they were everything. And this is the big boss in charge. So he was always like, mm-hmm. it's my call or you get out. So we don't have that sort of, you know, hands on managerial skill on the Super Eagles and honest and decent selection, selection, uh, selection process. Selection process in the sense that we shouldn't be knowing, uh, we shouldn't be knowing about Alassane now. Alassane has been there. We shouldn't make Oyedika feel like he's not good enough as a midfielder. Oyedika has always been good. You understand? We shouldn't, we shouldn't overlook other aspects of other players and say they can't be part of the team. No, that is poor selection. That is laziness on the part of the manager. So when you look at the way Nigeria play nowadays, it's always like, I don't know. So Emiros is four four two like four two four. Sometimes Emiros is four four two like is a four four two manager. Mm-hmm. Emiros is like four two four because he has so many attacking options. Now Wilfred is Wilfred is not part of the Afcon now. People are panicking like this shouldn't be a problem. You should have prepared yourself for situations like this if you are mm-hmm. giving chance to older young midfielders, players who yes. easily come yes. to the team. I'm not for all these emotional call ups or you know people leaving. People living in past memory. Oh, you have to bring this player because he did well in the under 17 10 years ago. You have to bring this person because he did this. No, we are talking about current form. On current form, there are players in that team that shouldn't be part of the team. But Nigerians are very funny. Some people love to do grandstanding where they will share money and people will say, ah, that guy, he should always be there. Is he worthy of being part of the team? The coach himself hasn't really been honest with his own selection sele- uh, selection process as well, like I said. So his style, his selection and everything. But well, we can't all keep talking about this. When it was a problem we had seen from the beginning, it's a problem we had seen from the onset. The guy had shown you what he was going to do. Who is this guy? What does he want to do? There are players who I feel, in my opinion, like should be given a chance. I'm not saying everyone has to go to the AFCON, but make them part of the team. Let your selection process be wide and, you know, reflective of the fact that you um why to to select his team and me you can't get the best of Nigeria to step into the midfield position that has been problem has been a problematic position. Also in terms of the goalkeeping, I mean with due respect to Francis Uzo, he came at the time Nigeria were having goalkeeping crisis. But the honors on him to do better. The honors on him to improve. If people are saying it's like saying Somebody they say they say you be rich, you be rich, you can't get blood for your mouth. Waiting be that now. You understand? Like you yeah. understand? So I feel like um I feel like Francis Uzo for all the criticism is a fantastic good goalkeeper in my in my opinion. Maduka Okoye is not a bad goalkeeper either. I think the pressure and everything, some of these players can't stand it. And when you are in goal for a country like Nigeria, you are either ready or you're not. Come or you leave. If you know you're not good enough. We have the best of the best players that you have to select from. So if the manager has not been lazy in his selection and he has not really shown that he doesn't know much about Nigerian football, that's lazy. That's that's that for me is lazy scouting. If you can't bring the best of the players to compete, so if Francis Uzo is under pressure and he's suffering a lot from you know the pressure and everything, give a chance to other goalkeepers. Maybe that would make him you know understand that look, it's not his property. He has to he has to be challenged. I understand wanting to protect him. I understand it. Well, um, every player in, in the Super Eagles should not feel like, should not feel too comfortable that whether he plays badly or he plays good game, he deserves a chance. No. Who's all, like I said, is not a bad goalkeeper. Maduka Okoye is not a bad goalkeeper. Um, other goalkeepers, uh, there, are, there are other goalkeepers in the local scene as well that haven't been given uh, opportunities. I'm not saying you must start them. Give them an opportunity. Watch them train with the team. Let your goalkeepers train and make a decision about them. So those are some of the things that, and then also he hasn't even figured out what he's doing with his back line. What is he doing? You understand? Yes. So these are the things you go into mm-hmm. tournament and then you understand why Nigerians have lower expectations about the team going into a major tournament. And that's very sad. We are not saying, oh, Nigeria must win every tournament they go and participate in. But at least give, give people a chance to see that, okay, you've been building the team. Mind you, this is the same man that has been working without getting paid as well. So if you if we want to criticize the coach, we also need to criticize our federation for not fulfilling their own obligations as well in terms of paying the coaches. The players too, are they motivated? No, they are not. Players are owed over 20 matches in bonuses. They are owed bonuses over 20 matches. Some of those money, the new federation president is saying he came and he those problems. He doesn't have the money to sort out 
this money. People are saying, mm. or they are paid money, a lot of money in their club side. People are meant to be paid their dues. If your aunt, if your dad, if your uncle go somewhere and play, and they are not paid their money, or they go somewhere to work and they are not paid, you feel bad for them too. So don't say, oh, because the players are spending money in Europe, then they, no, it's their dues. It's what's been agreed with them, and you have to pay them. You understand? So the players are not motivated. The manager is unpaid. The manager that is unpaid is the same man we want to criticize again. And then we're asking ourselves, if he does not want the job, he should walk away. And then the guy doesn't want to go. He, he, he's being owed from his first um, contract. And now he's gotten into the second one and he hasn't been paid. For me, everything about the manager from, the, from day one has been a red flag, in my opinion. And then him desperately yeah. collecting $50,000 from $70,000 shows desperation. What is continuity? No, it shows desperation on my part. Because if you're, if you're a man who knows your own worth, you would not fight for your contract to be, for your salary to go down. You want the salary to improve. But he hasn't earned it on paper. Yes. He hasn't earned it in results. And then the NFF, too, they haven't delivered in terms of paying his salary. So you're saying that is the same man you want to question. So everything with our football is just, what's that word? Jaga Jaga. And we don't, you don't expect to find success in the midst of Jaga Jaga. True. True. Now you've seen uh, the way um, journalism has evolved compared to when you started. Um, what would you say are the negatives and are the positives of this evolution? I think um, this, I mean, I'm young. I, I came in young and uh, I'm still young in my opinion, if I have to say, because some people I met, they are still there as well. In journalism, there's no retirement age. It's only when you feel like you don't really enjoy what you're doing anymore that you leave or you find other things that inspire you or motivate you. Um, when Back in the day when we started, you know, we didn't have social media like this. We didn't have a whole lot of things. Press conferences are like exclusivity. You go into mix zones, mm. they're exclusive, but nowadays they're no longer exclusive and all that. Because somebody can mm. even have their phone now. <laughs> Yakubu said I'm old. Mm. I agree. <laughs> you know, so um, you, nowadays you can just sit in a press sent a uh, press zone and then somebody's recording and all the things you think you have is gone so nowadays there's more yes there, you know nowadays there's more there's the blessing of the social media there's the opportunity for some of the players to actually know what you're saying about them imagine i'm talking here now some players might be sitting in camp and be like ah so this man is talking about me i go fight and when he come you know there's that interaction there's that opportunity um, for you to yeah. know what's going on yeah. and but the problem now is they are no longer gatekeepers in 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 the media they are no longer gatekeepers. Before you send your stories out, somebody should vet it, somebody should check it, somebody should edit it. Mm -hmm. You know, nowadays, mm -hmm. one person can just, just bring out his phone and spread fake news, and it's all over the place. The same way good news should travel is the way fake news will travel, and then people will rush yes. over it and all that. And then the way we cover AFCON nowadays is a lot different than when we used to cover back in the day as well. You know, nowadays you have, you know, the digital camera has evolved. People are using their mobile phones as cameras. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm. the players now understand the impact of the media mm. back in the day people are journalists they are familiar with they will speak to them they will stop to speak to them nowadays you don't need to know everyone you walk away everybody will say oh look he walked away and everything and you get into your power with the media so the media have become so powerful but at the same time they've also they've also become the devil that you need to avoid sometimes because like i said uh, mm. people need to go through certain aspects of media training to call themselves journalists nowadays any blogger with due respect to bloggers they are talented bloggers and they are also considered to be media as well so some people just call themselves blogger without anyone controlling what they put out there without anyone vetting what they go without a gatekeeper checking the kind of things they put out so nowadays you know when we were in cameroon for instance during the stampede uh, at the stadium some people exaggerated the figure of death because they just wanted and that was what people went with on social media remember when nigeria played in um. ghana in their World Cup qualifier, a man, I think yes. one of the team officials passed away. People said he was attacked by the fans. And on social media, he was selling. Mm. CNN grabbed it. Yes. People, people took it. And I was angry because some of the people who posted those things were journalists I knew. Um, like I know, I, I said I knew. Anyway, maybe I don't know them anymore again. So you understand? Because you, you don't post stuff like that without, you know. And then the world believed that Nigerian fans attacked the man and the man died. What do you think is going on in the mind of the man's family? They assume mm. that their man has gone to work in Nigeria and has been attacked by fans and has been killed by fans. Rather than mm. knowing that the man had health, it was, an, it was obviously, um, he suffered um, heart attack and all that. And that's not the narrative. So 
the media that you see nowadays, everyone is a journalist. Somebody can see you having now in the Super Eagles training camp. Maybe you're just picking the boy. Ah, they brought, a, they brought one random player to come and train with the Eagles. And people will, hey, I've told you, this coach is useless. This person is useless. They brought this thing. So there's no control over what is being shared and everything. And back then, you know, accrediting journalists, nowadays, CAF are dealing with about how many numbers of journalists covering the f one? That goes back to that question you asked about how big is the tournament. CAF are dealing with numbers of accreditation, yeah. huge number. Back in the day, you used to have maybe everything put together, maybe 100 journalists covering the AFCON. Now you are getting 5,000, 10,000 interest mm. in AFCON alone. So that tells you everything you need to know about how a tournament, how the continent is evolving and things are changing. And the media needs to change with this. It's just that people need to be careful. And I think until they start punishing certain people for misinformation, for sharing, you know, fake news and all that, people won't stop because everyone sees themselves as a journalist. I mean, I don't think my job is mm. online because if you come and say I said something, I can back up what I say. But other people will just randomly share something. And funny enough, I think the word just gravitate towards negative news or sensationalism. People just come out this. Ah, uh, mm. Eto slap his player. That's the news. For example, Eto hasn't slapped anyone. Yeah. Uh, you know, like uh, Paji or Kocha came and said this person is not good enough. You understand? And then problem will start. You know, and then it's 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 crazy. It's crazy. This generation is a blessing and a cause as well. Like they are blessed with a lot of technology, improvement. Media has evolved, like I said. A lot has changed with the way we cover the AFCON from back in the day, from you know, floppy disk era to mini disk to what's that other one they use USB and everything. Now it's come completely you can you can even broadcast on your phone. You can broadcast a press conference, you can broadcast a whole lot of things. You can catch a player in the corner and he's giving you exclusive. We got an exclusive from mix zone where players saying tomorrow bros we're not going to train no they never pay our bonus you know you know you get that you instantly you are getting your news not like you have to wait till the next day things are happening now yeah. and, that. and then and yeah. and because of the social media era as well like i said a blessing and a cause some people would rather would rather pay influencers to talk about them because they know people are going to you know people are going they want to do this but here, um, here's, here's the danger here's the danger the way you are paying them to talk about you is the way somebody will pay them to destroy you. It's as simple as that. Yes. So everything that has a blessing has its cost as well. You know, back then, people, they would just bring up one striker to come and train with Nigeria. We don't know anything about him. But nowadays, you can go on the internet. You know what everyone is doing. Somebody who has only played four match in a year, I mean, in a season, uh, oh God, why are you bringing him to our team, you understand? And I think the thing that the world is changing and Nigeria is not changing is, can you imagine in the Nigerian national team, other countries, managers will have a press conference where he's defending his choice of selection, where he's explaining the reason why he selected certain players. In Nigeria, we don't do that. They just send you the mm. press conference. They just send you the names of players with colorful words. Ah, this person is coming back after 10 games. This one is back again. Boom, boom, boom. Mm. The media will now be cracking their head like, how did they make this? And then, then that's where you see the negative news in, to, in the build-up to the tournament. Because if the coach mm. has sat down to defend, why the, the coach will sit down and defend his choice of selection, He's not giving that opportunity to defend it. So whatever we see is what people will take. And then you are able to, you are not able to say, ah, or Benny, why is, why is this person coming into this squad? There is no opportunity, you understand? There's no opportunity for the media to ask um, the, the, the manager, the selection. And some of the questions the fans want to ask is the media that will be able to ask the journalist. You know, like you can come and say, oh, so, so how are you addressing your goalkeeping situation? Why is player A and B doing this? But countries like Senegal, South Africa, most of them, Algeria, Morocco, they are coming in, announcing their squad, giving room to media to ask questions. You understand? So they're asking the questions about selection, um, training, you know, some of the question mark about the coach himself. Have you been paid your wages? Are your players happy? Is it true your players are old wages? You know, you put that before the coach, you put, and then when the, when the tournament starts, people won't be speculating because you already know. And then players who are selected, some of the players whom you've selected as a manager, you have to explain to people why you pick this particular player. You, you, mm. owe, people, you owe people that. You owe the fans, you owe the media. That is what But we don't do that in Nigeria. So, so many things are just, are just not right. And like I said, we can't keep lamenting, complaining, crying and all that. It's just how we are. It's just how we are. And I haven't seen a lot of changes in that aspect. I would love in Nigeria where 
the manager is put before the media to explain some of his selections. I love a station whereby question about his wages, about players' bonuses, what's going on in the team, so that the fans will not go away thinking, ah, we have a good team now, we should be winning the AFCON, not knowing that there are fundamental issues that the team will be traveling with to the tournament. And it serves some people if they don't even know these issues behind behind the, behind the background. Yeah, it is what it is, man. Like, what can we do? Somebody's calling me, Monsieur Adepoju. Don't worry, I get that a lot. I even had to ask Monsieur one day because when I was in the bottom, people say, "Are you related to Monsieur?" We are not even we are not related. I don't look like him. I don't know where people get that from, but it is what it is. So, like you said, I I, I think we need to do more as a nation. The rest of the world, everything, things are changing. Look at us. We are going to the Afcon. Just look at us. We are going to the Afcon. People are focused more on the goalkeeping. People are focused more on uh, uh, how did this coach arrive at this? What's going to happen with our midfield? You understand? No doubt, we have good. We have attackers. We have attackers are not only the ones to pick. And then I think some one problem that I observed during the last camp in Portugal that I think I didn't really hear outside. Right? I didn't see. Uh, I think I remember tweeting it one day, and somebody was like, "Now you sabi, which kind of nonsense is this?" So. Coaches have a way of bringing out the best in their players. Some players have a way of dealing with coaches like that or issues around a coach that is shouting. So, after mm. coach, the, the fullbacks are always in trouble because he's screaming at them. Hey, 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 he's shouting. And, you know, some players like it when you put them on their toes, but some players will panic and crumble under that. These are professional footballers. No matter how you back, remember when Power Onigbindi went in 2002, people said Baba wasn't standing up. And the man said, mm. the Argentina coach that was standing up, where did Argentina get to at the World Cup? You know, that was a joke in my mm. But modern day football, mm. coaches have made their mark. Coaches have done what they need to do with their team. So when you start backing at the player, it, it, <laughs> I think you have a dog in your house. Somebody's asking you. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> so, so anyway, was screaming, and I think some of his players spoke to him like, don't scream at this player. It, it's funny how eventually that player could tell from there in Portugal that I won't be part of the team because the coach was busy uh -huh. screaming and shouting. And the guy's like, no, guy, come, I know what I'm doing. Mind you, they are professionals. Some of them maybe like it, but in an ideal world, you don't want to be screaming at your players. And some of them also feel like this guy is screaming too much. Do you understand? It still won't change the fact that how you set your team up. If some of them are missing, you need to find you need to find a way to communicate with your team effectively. That's why you need a leader in your squad. That's why you need to have a communication skill. And I remember when we used to ask some of the players in the Nigerian league, like, when your coach, you do like this, you think they talk, they say, my guy, nothing. You know. just do one like this, like, maybe you better make you enter. I, say, I thought he's a star, like, he's telling you, say, ah, they just forget. You understand? Some of the things you see, and so you don't need to allow your animated figure to actually distract some of the players as well. Some of them, like I said, are strong enough to stand. A player like Victor Simon, you are screaming at him, he understands. Victor said, now speak. Now area, he will tell you, okay, I don't hear. He will, you, you understand? But some of these are players yeah. who, some of them can't really withstand pressure. Once you shout at them once, everything they want to do on the on, on the thing, you know, but obviously, like someone said, you can't treat every player the same. Some of them, some of them can, can withstand that. Some of them, but you as a coach, have you really set up your team in such a way that you want them to, that you want to bring the best out of them? Not everyone will be Sir Alex. Not everyone will be Mario. Some of them are Avirena. Some of them um, are, you know, uh, Yo Masha, who won the AFCON. Some of them will be Shaibu Amodu, and some of them will be Stephen Keshi. Daniel Amokachi can testify to how Keshi operates the same way he can testify to how Amodu operates because he worked behind those managers. Amodu used to get criticized a lot by because of the style he plays, because of how but Amodu will get you results. The same way, you know, people will talk about Genetro. I think old school and new school coaches, some of some of the old school coaches still have that aspect of their game where they still scream at their players as well. But I just think that was really something that I was finding out very strange. And the fact that not all of them, um, not all of them um, really understand or can deal or handle such noise coming from the manager. Okay. You, this is an offside question, though. It was not among the plans mm -hmm. or anything, but it just came up while we're having this discussion. You, had, you did time in kickoff. I remember reading a lot of kickoff magazines growing up. There was you writing, there was Samaudu writing, there was Emeka Nyadike as editor, there was Colin who was covering the local league then. I remember I would read a lot of 
um, interviews, like the main cover uh, players, I read their interviews and all that. And you always somehow, you always interview Victor Obina. <laughs> and I've, over the years, I've discovered that you guys have built a relationship. So in the course of your carrying out your duties, do you end up becoming friends with some of these players? That's a very tricky question. I think there is, there is, it's a very difficult one. If you make friends with the players, then it becomes difficult for you to actually criticize them or analyze them or, you know, do um, stories that will actually be fair, a balanced report. As a journalist, you are taught, you are taught to be objective. You know, you are taught to, be, to balance your stories and all that. Some of the players, I don't go out looking to be friends with players. I don't go out looking for, for in the course of their career, they notice that maybe this guy criticized me fairly. Maybe this guy is, me and Vincent Enyama, I don't know if Vincent, me and Vincent Enyama, we used to fight. And there was one baby, I wished him happy baby on, um, on, on um, Instagram. And he said something about, he said something about, ah, um, my, it, it was a very strong word for me. Some people felt like, Vincent shouldn't have said that, but I said, people will use their language. He said, um, uh, my, did he say my biggest critic or my enemy tongue friend or brother? That was how he put it. Because I was highly critical of him. You know, in the beginning, he was struggling with crosses now. So um, there, yes, was me, yes. there, there was me yes. and this guy, Nudi Obalola, and, you know, calling new Vincent from their days, you know, from his Zayimba days. I knew Vincent. When Pauni Binde brought Vincent to the Super Eagles in 2002, I met Vincent and uh, Mejide at, we, we, we come way back, you understand? But mm. if you are a journalist and these players are not that's why i always warn young journalists be careful what you take from players once you start taking money from them or benefiting from this thing they expect it to be a transactional thing so if you're taking money from me you're not meant to criticize me if you're friends with me you're not meant to criticize yeah. me but we build yeah. relationship as colleagues maybe they, some there are some players in the super now. when i say i want to they say they, they don't want to talk even though the other ones are trying, oh, you don't want to talk to him i'll say don't force him he doesn't want to talk if he doesn't feel like talking he doesn't want to talk so for um victor Obina, like you pointed out. I remember when the team came back from the 2005 World Cup. Remember, I was serving a band then. He had gone to, I don't know, I think he was with Eimba, and then he went on loan to Quara United. Mm -hmm. And then he had gone to Brazil. I think they took him to Brazil to go and sign a deal. And then, he, and then he mm -hmm. came and signed with Inter Milan. So when yeah. he, that band made sure he didn't, that, work, that, that band Go for that him from that World Cup. So when the team mm -hmm. came back from the World Cup, this story probably will be now forgot. When the team came back from um, when the team came back from that World Cup, they were going on a tour to the French embassy to a telecommunication company and all of these places just to celebrate their second place finish at the World Cup. It was a massive thing. You know, not all the players made that trip, but I, th I think in Kadidiji was there, maybe as he promised, Sunday, uh, there's Monday, James. Some of the players were there. So Vince, um, what's his name? Obina came. You know, he was part of the team, but he didn't go to the mm. World Cup. So Obina came. And I remember that mm. people were going, yeah, it's time for, so people were, people were, people were more or less critical of him. Some of them were attacking him to go back to Enyimba. Ah, what this, what the chairman would do to you? What is it? What is that? What that? So for someone who grew up in Ajegunle, we've seen young players being lured into some funny contracts. Some of the things they didn't know. So I understand where Obina was at that time. So I went to him. I said, oh, um, you know what, um, Obina, all these people are saying whatever they want to say and everything. You are the player. No one knows what you're going through now. But remember, even those who went to the World Cup might not end up having the kind of career that you are probably going to have. Sure. No, that you are probably sure. going to have. So people come yeah. with different... You, this thing has happened. It's a stain on your... CV to people and all that, but if you think you've done the right thing, try and get a lawyer, try and get people who are to sort out this your issue with Aimba and you know, um, these people that took you away and all of those things. Try and sort it out. And he was looking at me, he was looking at me, and that was it. And I think from there, you know, I, I think he was home for a bit as well. I can't remember again now. So I interviewed him for Cry United for Kick Up Magazine, and then we talked. So it's not like it's not like you go out 
looking to be friends with them. Some of them know you're very fair. Some of them know that, some of them can even tell when they know you are, you are in need to collect money from them or you want anything from them and all that. But once you start staying, once you start, once you start going and demanding or building that relationship where it's give and take, I give you, I write about you, and then you're expecting me not to criticize you and anything, then there was a, there's going to be a problem. And that's why I try to talk to young, young journalists now always assume that maybe me and the players, we are close because I see them in England or these are, no, I do my job. I criticize them when need be. I'm not afraid to speak out when they are wrong. I, some of them, I go behind the scene and say, this thing you are doing, bro, what do you think you are trying to achieve here, blah, blah, blah. And then you speak to them, they appreciate it. So if by tomorrow you are in the media, you are talking about some of it. I remember when Keshi was coach, people would go to Keshi and say, oh, um, coach, she knows he's tweeting about you. Keshi will ask them, what did he say? Then they say he, said, he said the same thing to me last night, too. Because I went with him when he was in Togo. I went to cover him when he was in Mali. I paid my way with him. Pay me to, I, I went to do a story there. You know, I went to Togo. He wanted to show me um, Mali's um, training facility that they did with their goal. Then he wasn't even planning to come and coach Nigeria. He wanted to show me what they've done with their FIFA fund. He said, come and watch us play. And I went and saw it. I was like, wow. And then when he qualified for the World Cup in Togo, me and Shegun, we paid him, the kickoff photographer. We took a road trip to Togo to go and see him in Togo. It was four, three days after he qualified for the World Cup in 2006. And the 2006 World Cup went in 2005. So, People know what you're capable of doing. People know. Me and Yakubu fought. Yakubu is here. We have fought before. Me, you know, you will find you, you, you know, some of them, for some of them, it's like this guy is too stubborn or something. No, it's, it's not like that. I am doing my job. You should do your job too. You understand? And eventually, yeah. after their career, some of them will still talk. And some of them will say, yeah, those things you used to say to me, um, those things you used to say to me, you know, I didn't listen back then and all that. So some of these players, I like, I like, I like when they are able to differentiate, and that's what happens with some of our people. They don't understand. They say journalists are always fighting with players. No, the players they know who are the ones, and then some of the players have come with allegations like some people pay some people to write about them in a bad way to criticize them. Those things are unnecessary, and I don't, I don't buy that. So for me, I just think um, if you're a professional and you do your job, some will not like you. Some obviously don't like me, and I don't care. I'm not doing my job to be liked. I'm doing my job to just be fair and report as it should be. Hmm. There is a question here. In your opinion, which I pinned, in your opinion, what made Keshi's selection for 2013 have gone effective? Um, I think, remember, Keshi was working with some of these home based players from, from, the, from, from home. He's been, he's, been, he's been training them. When the professionals are away, he's training some of the yeah. He's always getting um, some of the players to come in camp and he's known everything about them. I think what happened in that tournament was the fact that everyone had written Keshi off and also they could see that this is a man who is not just a legend. He could put, if he can put some of the top players away, he can easily discard you too if you're not giving him what he wants. Yeah. So the turning point, people, people might say whatever they like. I think the turning point for the team was beating Ivy Coast in, in, um, where did we play that game? Um, Rustenberg, I think. That was the one, that was the popular one where he had been told to, they have, they have already bought their ticket. They are, they are supposed to leave. After that game that night, they were supposed to leave. The NFF had given up. Nobody had, nobody believed that. They already booked their ticket. They are playing Ivory Coast. Favorite for the trophy. What is What are you supposed to expect? So I think there was, because remember behind the scene, there was issue going on because he left out, um, he left out Yobo. Remember there was that issue. Because Yubo wasn't starting, and he opted for Obuabona and um, Omeru in the pairing of the in the in the defense there. And there were other young players who were coming. So Ikechuku Uche wasn't starting. He preferred to go with um, Emenike and Ide, you know. But Ikechuku Uche was the top scorer in qualifying. Everyone expected him to start, but Keshi's style was different. Keshi's choice was his choice. And then Yubo too. People felt like, oh, maybe they should give chance to other young players. You know, there, there was there was a lot going on, but after that quarterfinal, I think the mindset of the players, the coach as well, everyone could now see, and he's saying, look, they want to have to go. And the way Kechi, the way Kechi speaks to his team is different from how these other people will speak. Oh. When Kechi is telling you, Kechi is looking at me, saying, she know, in your in um um, he says in your but he speaks. Keshi, Keshi will speak to me in Yoruba only. You say, any le ba, I want more like. We are the one who make this player sport brat. 
like why do you treat them like God, that they are God, like they are God? They need to fight. Do they know what it means to play for Nigeria? Do they know? I'm not saying she was a perfect man, but my guy, all of these things will work. You are, you are with someone who has won the World Cup, a guy who is regarded as a legend in your country. You are, he's managing you. I beg, you know, you have to deliver. And I think after that Afghan, after that quarterfinal victory, look at how they steamrolled over Mali. Burkina Faso made the final. We didn't even expect to see Burkina Faso in the final. They were in the final. You understand? Nigeria won that trophy. And for me, a lot of credit should go to the players. A lot of credit should go to the coach for the way they were treated and how the tournament ended for them. I think that's one of his. It's just like Leicester winning the, the Premier League in, 20, in 2016. Yeah. Yeah. That was how it was. Like, no one expected yeah. Nigeria to. We didn't. Uh, the world did. How come before that we didn't qualify now? We didn't qualify for the 2012 one. So. Kudos to the to the players. Kudos to all of them, and I think that was what worked for them. Like they had a man who could speak to them, and they had the team spirit and morale to actually turn things around after being written off by all. So sometimes maybe we should write the super video. Maybe they'll just shock us, you know. Maybe we should stop demanding. Just I beg these people, make them go, and then maybe they'll just come and surprise us. So that was what happened in 2013. Okay, but on a final note, I would like to indulge you to build your ultimate AFCON 11. Ah. <laughs> Wait, yeah. Nigeria or, or Africa? Nigeria. Nigeria. I think I shared one on your page, no? No, no, you ah. didn't. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. No, it's not. I know it's difficult, but it's, it's, it's doable. Yeah. Uh, ah. Okay, so for me, in goal would definitely be um, Vincent Ayama. Okay. Vincent Ayama. I mean, with due respect to Okala, Ogedengbe, and other previous goalkeepers, including Peter Rufai, others who had come before him. Mind you, some of these people won the Afghan as well. Who probably won in '94, yes. you know. So, but Enyama for me, undoubtedly, the greatest goalkeeper we've ever had in Nigeria, and that's paying respect to other. In right back, hmm, I think in right back, I think I went with Yista Shofoluwe. I think, I think I went with Yista Shofoluwe. Yeah, Yista Shofoluwe. I'm not aware. No, I think, I think, I think I went for you. I post, I, okay. I posted it on your page. I think. I went for Yisa Shofoluwe. I need to find that thing so it doesn't look like I'm saying I'm I'm hundred percent sure I I'm hundred percent sure I posted it. So I went I, I can't remember. Allah, you, uh, uh, why are you doing this? <laughs> I think I did. Um I think I did. I posted it. Maybe you missed it. I posted it on you said to put our um Afcon best eleven and I was I was confused. I thought maybe it was the, and then in center back, I think in center back it was easy. Christian Chuku and Stephen Keshi. I think I went to Stephen Keshi and um uh wait. Where is your where did you put that thing? You posted it now. Your best I can't find it again, Joe. But let me just go. I can't find it. I think you posted it. So left back. Who did I go for? Left back. Was it Ben Uroa? Okay. I think it was Ben Uroa. I think it was Ben Uroa. Um, everyone has their own choice. The reason I've gone for Christian Chuku is clear. He won the Afghan in 1980. And I think it's a lot easy. I think what, what happened is there's always a generational argument. Some people, because of what they didn't see, they will say, ah, no, Ben Uroa was 94. Yeah, no, no. I'm, no, I'm just talking about the defense line now again. Chuku, some people will be arguing. Okay, okay, okay. Somebody is saying, why not? Yeah. Somebody, Chuku definitely. somebody is saying, why mm. not um, Uche Okechuku? And I've said my own. Stephen Keshi and mm. Okechuku, um, Stephen Keshi and Christian Chuku, and then Ben Uroa on the left. Um, ben Uroa was, Ben Uroa was ahead of his time. Ben Uroa now as a left back in this modern day, man, he was something else, you know. And that 94 happened, kudos to him. Um, you know, and um, going in the midfield, uh, midfield, <laughs> I think this was where there was problem. Uh, I think I went to Muda Lawal. Mm -hmm. Muda Lawal. Decent. Sorry? I said that's decent. Yeah, Musa La Muda Lawal. 
my guy, let me check this thing again before some people come and beat me on this page now. I think I have I have it somewhere here. I have it here. No, no, no. I'll bring it in. I'll bring it out here. I have it. You didn't see it. I posted it and I said people will argue and do whatever they want. Um yes, yes, yes. Was yes. it under Obina's post? You you post on Obi Nine, eh? Uh, um maybe. I don't know. Maybe. But now I I found it. I have found it. You know worry yourself. I don't see him. <laughs> okay. So, so I went and Yamain go. You search for Luwe on the right. Benny Roa on the left. Christian Chuku. Stephen Keshi. And then in midfield, mm -hmm. I went Mudalawal. Sunday Ulisse. Um, then left and right. Sheikh Modek Bami, right wing. Okay. Best African 11, they said, oh, they didn't say every yes. other player you have watched. Uh -huh. mm. So, um, check Modek Bami on the right, and then Emmanuel Amunike on the left. I okay. I would love for Henry Wosu to play behind Rashidi Yakini. And that, for me, is my best 11. You you said somebody who played alongside you. Who is playing alongside Yakini? I said Henry Wosu will play behind Yakini. Wow, Henry Wusu, I, I didn't see that one coming at all. It's, so, like I said, people would disagree, and that is why they say best 11. You, the generation you watch, I saw Moro 88. Yeah. I saw Moro 88. I saw Algeria 90. You understand? So some of my decisions are not based on what we are watching now. And that's why from, yes. from the 2013 success team, Vincent and Yama for me was a standout player, and that's why it's in goal. You understand? And um, somebody, another guy shared this opinion with me. I think the only place we disagree was um, he, he replaced one player. I think, I think he opted for one player instead of Ernie Wilson. And I'm saying if I put Ernie Wilson there, you have a complete team. And that is my all-time thing as well. So I think that was, that was it. So for me, this is my best 11 in the colors of Nigeria at the AFCON. Do I have other players that I would love to be a part of the team? I think, I think yeah. I think, yeah, uh, some players should get a shout. Some, some players should get a shout as well, you know. Um, the goalkeeper, maybe Peter Rupai on the bench, Paji, Osinjeji Okocha, Yakubu Aegbeni. If Yakubu wants to fight me because I'll pick Yakini over him, he should score more than Yakini and then I'll pick, I'll pick Yakubu. If he can score more than Yakini and if. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Do you understand? And. Um, so those are some of the that's some of my choices and that's that's my ultimate um, best eleven ever for Nigeria and the Afghan. Some people are still young; they might still break into the team eventually by the time they finish their career. Who says Victor Simen can break in? Yeah, you know, and um, yeah. who says a Victor Boniface cannot come and perform something? And you know, mm -hmm. um, for me, Vincent Ayama, Joseph Yobo, the two first centurion that we have in Nigeria. Genuinely, they gave it their all, they gave their everything. Um, Yakubu stayed in my heart after we went to that game. Remember that game in Sudan? Remember that game in Sudan that we won? When Amodu, when people had written Amodu and his team of Yakubu and Co, they went to Sudan to, to, get a, to get a win. And then he also scored a crucial goal against Kenya in the qualifier for 2010, maybe. 2010. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bakary Martins, too, was always there. There are players who, who have really done well for Nigeria. In this generation, and there are also other young. Yes, Sunday Ulisa is in my list. Who is asking? Proudly asking. Come and beat me. Ulisa is in my squad. Sunday Ulisa, Captain Fantastic. Um, um, funny enough, me and um, Sonny we clashed. I followed his career very well. And then I wrote a piece. And the boy wasn't happy, but it's my opinion. And we're still, we're still, we're still, we're still talking. And we are still good. That's why I said, if you do your job, people would like you, people would dislike you. That's fine. Um, I'm not doing journalism to be yeah. liked. I'm doing journalism because it's my passion. It's what I love doing. And um, we can't we can't all be liked. If you are doing this job to be liked, you end up being disappointed. Yeah. But a lot of people won't like your opinion and what you think. I think yeah. Lisa is undoubtedly one of the one of the one of, one of the best brains we have alongside Sheyolo Finjano. These are two 
of Nigeria's finest brains, and um, okay. if the system if the system was good, these are people that would probably step in as technical director and do what definitely you understand. Definitely, people, um, we do yeah. with due respect to the person occupying the position. I don't think we see a lot in terms of how our football structure is built, in terms of what people do generally. So we don't really get to know or see the job of our technical director. They shouldn't meant to. They are not meant to be seen. But of course, we need to see the quality of their work in terms of how things are done. You understand? And um, yeah, somebody saying, somebody saying, um, um, Amokaj, Amokaj is a, is a brother. I have to pick a level, and I pick a level. People are angry again. <laughs> Tai Tai was threatening me not to come back. Tai Tai was really a one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He called, he come and beat me. He knows where I stay. I can send him my address. He come and beat me. <laughs> and um, for me, again, people who are just joining, I've said it Vincent and Yama, Yusta Shofoluwe on the right, Benny Roa on the left, Vincent Chuku and Stephen Keshi in the heart of defense, Sunday Ulisse in the midfield, Mudalawa there, Emmanuel Amunike on the left, Sheikh Modek Bami on the right, Ernie Wosu behind. Rashidi Yekini, and um, if if um, if um, uh, the boot wants to beat me, he has to first go through Erin Woods to come and beat me. You know, um, you know, maximum respect to Dilo Tarawa. Mm. You can't have if you want to if you say set two teams. Uh -huh, uh -huh, you have other players that will be in the other team too. But for Definitely. me, this undoubtedly my best eleven, based on what I have seen, based on what I have watched Nigeria do at the Afcon, and we are not just talking 2010 to now. We are talking from way back, from when we conquered Africa in 1980 to 82. Remember that team still went on to Libya, and then they got to the final in 84 in Ivory Coast. Remember, so some of these players that I mentioned, maybe people should need to go on Google and check. Maybe and then I, I was lucky enough to remember memories of Maroc '88. You know, anyone who was there, Samuel Okwaraji was there. We had Ademola Adeshino, Yistasho Folue, um, Andrew Uwe, um, Humphrey Edobo. We had uh, more players, zero uh, players, zero. This generation uh, made them calm down. You understand? Uh, so, but uh, it's by it's by time. It's like saying Messi is the is the greatest ever in Argentina football history. Others will remind you that uh, Diego Maradona. There was a Mario Kempes, you know, they will, they will go back to history, but that's how life is. All right, it's been a pleasure, Mr. Shina, having you share your experience, share your your time with us. I believe maybe we'll have learned one or two things from our football that probably we don't know of, that's not like in the open space and all that. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it's been a pleasure talking to you, sir. Thanks and for having me, oh, Avin, 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 you're doing a great job. Uh, you bring back memories uh, for some of us who are always eager to see back and look back. Remember when I talked to you, I said, "Ah, how do you how do you source your footages? Man, you do an amazing things." And I've heard former players tell me like some of the videos that they they, they didn't remember of themselves. Like you bring it out there, social media. Not everyone would do the kind of thing you do. That's why you're unique. You're special, and that's why you see some of these ex players. They follow you, and they're always thanking you because you don't forget their birthday. You know, I think this is something that we lack in Nigeria. Record keeping. Some of these players don't even know how many caps they have for Nigeria. You keep some of these records. You keep some of this information, and that's something that is absolutely. So, if you're thanking me, I should thank you. It's it's a pleasure being here, but at the same time, you do an amazing job. You do an incredibly amazing job for a young guy, man. Kudos to you for for the things you do. Thank you. I appreciate it. So do have a wonderful day and enjoy your evening. Or should I say enjoy your day and your year. Thank you very much. Anyone who won't fight me, they don't come. They don't fight me. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. Take right, care. Sir. Take care. One love. All right, bro. Bye.